There are two possible test statistics that we may use when dealing with one sample problems. The one we select depends on the available information. If we know the population standard deviation, then we use the one sample z test. The sampling distribution for this statistic is a standard normal distribution. We compare our z test to critical values from a standard normal distribution to determine whether to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Unfortunately, we rarely know the population standard deviation, and we must estimate this quantity from sample data. In this situation, we must use the one sample t test as our test statistic. It is very similar to the one sample z test. The main difference is that we use the sample standard deviation instead of the population standard deviation in the calculation. A consequence of this change is that the t test follows a t distribution instead of a standard normal distribution. The t-distribution is actually a family of distributions with each member defined by its degrees of freedom. A one-sample t-test has n minus 1 degrees of freedom, where n is the sample size. A t-distribution has a mean of 0 when the degrees of freedom is larger than 1, and it has a variance that approaches 1 as the degrees of freedom increases. Like the standard normal distribution, it is a symmetric and unimodal distribution. However, it differs from a standard normal distribution in important ways. The t-distribution has a lower peak than the standard normal distribution, and it also has heavier tails than the standard normal distribution. Heavier tails means there is more probability in the extreme regions of the distribution. These heavier tails are due to the increased variability associated with estimating the sample mean and the sample standard deviation when computing the t-test. Differences in the two distributions are more pronounced for small degrees of freedom. They are less apparent when the degrees of freedom is large. Interestingly, the t-distribution becomes more and more like a standard normal distribution as the degrees of freedom increases. To see this effect, watch the t-distribution change as the degrees of freedom changes from 1 to 30. The last figure shows that a t-distribution with 30 degrees of freedom is very similar to a standard normal distribution, but they are still not exactly the same. Both distributions have a mean of 0, but the t-distribution has slightly more variance. A t-distribution with 30 degrees of freedom has a variance of 1.07, which is slightly larger than a variance of 1 that we have with the standard normal distribution. It is not until the sample size is extremely large that the two distributions become the same. A consequence of having more area in the tails of the distribution is that for small degrees of freedom, more extreme values are needed to reject the null hypothesis. The figure on the left shows a standard normal distribution with the extreme 5% of the area shaded in blue. Notice that this region applies to values of 1.96 or more extreme. The figure on the right shows a t-distribution that also has the extreme 5% of the area shaded in blue. Notice that the rejection region does not begin until values are more extreme than 3.18. Thus, a more extreme value is needed to reach the rejection region for a t-statistic than it is for a z-statistic. We can look at critical values to see how the rejection region for a t-distribution becomes more similar to that for a standard normal distribution. The left column of this table shows the degrees of freedom, and the right column shows the critical value for a two-sided t-test with a significance level of 0.05. Recall that the same critical value for a standard normal distribution is 1.96. With one degree of freedom, the t-critical value is 12.71, which is very different from 1.96. Even with 30 degrees of freedom, the t-critical value is still larger than 1.96. This table also shows that as the degrees of freedom increases to infinity, the t-critical value gets closer to the z-critical value of 1.96. Thus, a t-distribution with an infinite number of degrees of freedom 
is a standard normal distribution. As stated earlier, each member of the T distribution is identified by its degrees of freedom. But what do we mean by degrees of freedom, and why is it n minus 1 for the one sample t test? Degrees of freedom refers to the number of independent pieces of information. When computing the sample mean, all data points provide independent pieces of information. However, when computing the sample standard deviation, there are only n minus 1 independent pieces of information because we have already computed the mean. That is why we divide by n minus 1 when computing an unbiased estimate of the standard deviation. The one sample t test also has n minus 1 degrees of freedom because we use the sample standard deviation in its calculation. Let's consider a less mathematical example to understand degrees of freedom. Suppose you and three friends go to the movies. It's a popular movie, and when you arrive, there are only four seats remaining in the theater. You are unaware of where you're going to sit, but you realize that once your three friends sit down, the choice has been made for you. There is only one seat left. Thus, only three people in your group of four get to choose a seat. That is, there were only three degrees of freedom in that problem. Now let's consider a more mathematical example. Given three data points, 4.7, negative 3.5, and 1.8, I need all three data points to compute the mean which is going to be one in this example. Once I have the mean, I only need two of those values and I can figure out the third value. And that's because the deviation scores must sum to zero. Remember, a deviation score is a value minus the mean. And the sum of the deviation scores must be zero. And you can see here, if I consider the deviation scores, the first two are going to be 4.7 minus one plus negative 3.5 minus 1. If I plug in just a variable x sub n for my last data point, I set this equal to 0 and solve for x sub n, it's very easy to see that that last value is going to be 1.8. Once we have computed the mean, only n minus 1 data points provide unique pieces of information. The t-distribution is also referred to as student's t-distribution, even though it was invented by a guy named Gossett, and here's why. Gossett worked for the Guinness Brewing Company, and it was during the course of his work that he created the t-test in the t-distribution. However, his employers would not let him publish the results because they considered it to be a trade secret. The compromise was that he got them to agree to let him publish the results under a pseudonym, and that pseudonym was student. And even though we know that Gossett created the distribution, we still refer to it as student's t-distribution. So next time you are enjoying a beer, reflect on the t-distribution and the joy it brings you. Because without beer, we wouldn't have the t-test or the t-distribution.